Welcome to the History Portal, your gateway to the history of Delaware County, Ohio. Presented by the History Committee and the Delaware County District Library. My name is Andrew Vermillion, Adult Services Specialist, and I'll be your narrator for today's History Portal podcast. Painstaking research has been provided by Robbie Apt, Outreach Manager. Did you know that Delaware County originally had more than one county fair? Today we'll dive into some of the history of those fairs and their locations and get ourselves in the right state of mind to enjoy the fair, jug day, and a week of September fun here in Delaware. Let's take a closer look at the Delaware Pumpkin Show and the three fairs. Let's begin with the Delaware County Fair, established in 1834. After being established in 1833, the Delaware Agricultural Society began an annual exhibition of domestic animals and manufacturers in October of 1834. The first home of the Delaware County Fair was on Delaware's east side, north of Central Avenue and west of the railroad. There were livestock exhibits displayed on an empty lot where the Baptist Church stands now, and domestic wares were viewed at the courthouse. Prizes ranged from 50 cents for the second place wool socks to $7 for the best stud horse. The fair was inactive during much of the 1840s but made a comeback in 1848 when the Agricultural Society was reformed. The grounds expanded in 1854 when seven acres were purchased from the heirs of M.D. Pettibone for $150 per acre. The fairgrounds as a whole were then fenced in and generally improved. As years went on, the grounds continued to grow, eventually encompassing nearly 30 acres off of Fair Avenue, where the Hickory Knolls development sits now. And in 1879, the Delaware Gazette reported that the grounds had expanded to include land on the east side of the river as well. The fair made its final move to Pennsylvania Avenue in 1939, after growing and bouncing around at different locations throughout the city. Through all these relocations and renovations, the Agricultural Society built something to last, as the Delaware County Fair remains the longest lasting and largest annual event in the county. The start of the fair in 1856 was also the end. On a sunny Thursday in October, a new powerful steam engine rolled into the fairgrounds after spending the previous week at the Ohio State Fair in Cleveland. On exhibition to the fair from the establishment of Bradley, Burnham, Lamb & Company, this was state-of-the-art machinery and it attracted dozens of spectators. The steam engine was built to power a threshing machine and like so many of the events surrounding the fair showcased an innovation in farming technology. Without warning, the calm, cool fall afternoon of October 2nd, 1856 erupted into chaos and left terrible tragedy and carnage as the boiler, which was manufactured in Sandusky, exploded. The next day's Delaware Gazette offered this description. Those who were present described the scene as terrible and heartrending beyond description. The portion of the grounds in which the engine stood were very much crowded at the time. The explosion produced a report as loud as a discharge of heavy artillery. A cloud of dust, steam, and cinders for a moment enveloped the prostrate forms of the dead and wounded scattered in every direction, while the groans and shrieks of the sufferers and the frantic exclamations of bereaved friends were such as could not fail to melt the most obdurate heart and bring tears to the eyes, however unused to weeping. In all, 14 people were either killed instantly or succumbed to their injuries eventually. But one witness and survivor, Margaret Reynolds Mendenhall, recorded the events preceding and immediately following the tragedy in her journal. Two days prior, she wrote, Our county fair commences on Wednesday next. Great preparations are being made in anticipation of it. I intend to take my cruel work, card basket, and a flower vase for display. And she continued then days later on October 6th, our fair is over, but oh, how suddenly it closed to what we anticipated. A most shocking and fatal incident, killed 12 in all. This happened last Thursday afternoon about 3 o'clock. I had just left the machine when it exploded with its horrific noise like thunder. Then came the shrieks of agony and screaming of friends finding their dearest ones torn to pieces or struck with some fatal piece. Others were scalded awfully, 
I feel to thank God for my preservation, for I was very near it at the time. Within hours of the explosion, a citizens committee met at the old courthouse to organize assistance for the families of those who had been killed. Resolutions were adopted calling for the closing of all business in the city the next day and the wearing of black armbands for 30 days. The committee also met with the owners of the Welsh and Lentz Circus, which had been scheduled to set up at the fairgrounds later that week. The Citizens Committee later reporting that the circus owners, having heard of the awful calamity which had befallen our community, anticipating the desire of our citizens, had resolved to refrain from exhibiting in our town, and promptly and kindly tendered the services of their company, horses, and vehicles to assist at the funerals of the unfortunate deceased, an offer accepted by city officials. In better years, the fair has featured groundbreaking and innovative attractions and exhibitions. In 1885, the fair hosted balloon races and a tightrope walker performed on a rope more than 280 feet long and 65 feet above the ground, thrilling audiences. Of the more unusual events approved by the fair board was the admission of Dr. Welsh, a dentist from Springfield. Dr. Welsh practiced in the middle of the fair's midway as fairgoers ambled by. One of my favorite prizes issued went to Charles Price of Radnor in 1947. He was awarded $15 in gold for the best ear of corn at that year's fair. The 1950s saw the fair first hosting automobile stunt shows, and anyone who's ever attended the Demolition Derby in recent years can confirm that these are popular attractions each year at the fair. Another notable exhibition went on display in 1958, when a new breed of chicken was shown at the fair for the very first time. An Arucana rooster and hen were shown by L.M. Hendricks of Richwood. The breed came all the way from Chile, South America, not Ohio, and delighted fairgoers with its bluish-green eggs, earning the new breed of chicken the nickname Easter Egger. Before the Delaware Fair in 1950, Russell Wright of Galena was at the Jersey Bulls Paris show in Plain City. He and two other gentlemen wanted to start a Jersey Futurity show and decided to hold the first one at the Delaware County Fairgrounds. Because the exhibition would feature three-year-old heifers, coinciding with the three-year-old jug race, the men called the show the Jersey Jug. The first Jersey Jug show was completed at the fairgrounds in 1954. Twelve three-year-old Jersey bulls and 24 females were nominated for that first show. The Jersey Jug's popularity required a move to the Ohio State Fair after just two years in Delaware. By 1959, the National Jersey Jug Futurity became a feature of the All-American Show and Sale, and it still takes place today. A few listeners that are longtime Delaware residents may remember that the fairgrounds once held the city pool. The Delaware County Swimming Pool opened on Memorial Day in 1940 and was located behind the fair office at the fairgrounds in, on Pennsylvania. During the long, cold winter months, Ohio Wesleyan permitted several local groups to use its newly completed indoor pool in the Pfeiffer Natatorium on campus. Moving on to another of Delaware County's formerly favorite fairs, the Rome Fair. Rome Corners was laid out in 1836 and incorporated in 1838. Because of a founder's love of ancient Roman history, Rome Corners was given its name. George Buckingham Carpenter founded the Rome Fair, which ran each year from 1877 to 1914. According to a Delaware Gazette article run in 1954, the Rome Fair had a gated mission of just 10 cents, and attendance grew quickly, with 4,500 folks attending the fair in 1899, and more than 8,000 just a few years later in 1904. The Rome Fair was not the spectacle that we're accustomed to, with no rides, no games, no races, no betting, and no alcohol, at least initially. Apparently some of these rules were relaxed in later years. Perhaps setting the precedent for what's become a tradition here in Delaware, an announcement went out to the community that school would be closed for a week in October 1905 to allow students and their families to attend the fair. The Gazette even printed a story about a 14-year-old boy 
who had hitched a ride on the Gazette wagon to get to the fair, quoting the boy as saying, I got a dollar fifty, and I need to get to the fair to get me a girl. In 1911, the Rome Fair was postponed one week due to a rainy forecast. The next week was unseasonably cold for September, but still saw more than 3,000 fairgoers in attendance. The postponement caused Ohio Attorney General Timothy Hogan to cancel his appearance, and he was replaced by the state librarian, J.H. Newman, and Congressman F.B. Willis. The Rome Fair held its own horse and hog shows, as one might expect, but also a baby show. One year, Alden J. Condit won the prettiest baby contest, with Edna Downing winning the crown for smallest baby and Maybelle Fleming for the biggest infant. Chief among odd exhibits were the pairs of raccoons and possums brought from Johnstown by Truman Bowman. I think we can all be happy that the state librarian and displays of large marsupials aren't all that pass for entertainment here in the 21st century. In 1914, the Rome Fair was graced by the presence of Governor James M. Cox, along with other notable speakers. The paper anticipated between 8 and 10,000 attendees for the brief two-day gathering, the livestock and agricultural features likely being a bigger draw than the governor. In 1915, the 38th year of the Rome Fair, the Sunbury News reported that there were more than 3,000 folks in attendance. Top draw that year was a large livestock showing that included 50 head of cattle, 86 sheep, 45 hogs, and dozens of horses. The Rome Fair also featured the Hall of Fancy Work and a hall for machine and auto displays. From 1909 to 1937, the Delaware County Fair was held in Powell. Here's a bit more about the history of the Powell Fair. For 38 years, from 1909 to 1937, the Delaware County Fair was held on Powell Road, just west of Powell on 12 acres of land leased to the fair board by Dr. John Campbell. Comprised of both wooded areas and open fields, Dr. Campbell's acreage was located just west of the railroad on Powell Road, with his house sitting on the adjacent property. If longtime locals remember the large yellow Victorian just west on Powell Road and Milano's Florist, well, they were originally one house split into two. The property was where the Murphy Party Barn was located on the south side of Powell Road and the racetrack behind there. Some of the pins and prize ribbons from these fair years are on display at the Powell Historical Society. Those folks have tons of great information and artifacts from Powell's past and from the fair. One little factoid picked up from the Powell Historical Society, there was no alcohol or bootlegging allowed on the fair property. A $10 reward was given per person caught and brought to face justice. In 1910, the Powell Fair added horse races to what was being billed as the biggest little fair in Ohio. The fair continued to grow, and in 1912 an electric lighting plant was installed to light the fairgrounds evening events. The following year in 1913, a prize purse of $10,000 was handed out for racing ponies, mules, roadsters, and saddle horses. Most of these events were on the track located on the south side of Powell Road. As the Powell Fair grew, so did the stakes. In 1913, the fair hosted a boys' livestock judging and milking contest, and extra prizes were awarded this year for the best corn and pumpkins. Despite the floods earlier that year, there was reportedly a great showing of farm produce. Fast forward now to 1915, and the Powell Fair's size warrants two big name celebrity appearances. The Delaware Gazette announced in September 1915 that Governor Frank Willis and then Senator Warren G. Harding would each visit Powell for the fair on Thursday and Friday, spending several hours greeting fairgoers and taking in livestock and produce competitions. Harding, a Blooming Grove, Ohio native, would be elected president, having received the Powell Fair bump just a few years later in 1921. 1920 saw three speed races scheduled with a prize purse of $100 for each race. 
That racetrack was still seeing occasional use even in the 1990s, but eventually succumbed to Powell's sprawl in 2001. While the Powell Fair had drawn thousands of spectators each year, there were only 300 residents in Powell in the fair's heyday. We're all pretty familiar with the elaborate butter sculptures on display each year at the Ohio State Fair, from cows and calves to Ohio heroes walking on the moon. But guess what? This awesome tradition started in Sunbury. In the early 1900s, the Ohio State University and the dairy processors of Ohio sponsored butter sculpting contests at the Ohio State Fair without any restriction on the subjects or the design. But in 1903, the first butter cow was featured at the Ohio State Fair, sculpted by A.T. Shelton and Company, distributors of Sunbury Cooperative Creamery Butter. This was the first of an annual exhibit for fair visitors, and in the 1920s, a calf joined the cow and the two have appeared each and every year since. One little butter sculpture factoid for you, it takes more than a ton of butter to make the cow, calf, and other accompanying sculptures each year. The Ashley Fair will be the next stop on our tour of the history of the Delaware County Fairs. The first Ashley Fair took place in 1912 and the annual event was noteworthy initially for being one of the first fairs each year. The Ashley Fair was founded as an outgrowth of the harness racing events using a track just south of town which can still be seen today. The fair grew and eventually took over a 21 acre plot of land on the south end of Main Street. After taking a year off in 1918 due to World War I, the fair resumed in 1919 and hosted more than 4,000 attendees during the four-day span of the event. The fair thrived in the 30s and 40s, with the Gazette predicting a turnout of 20,000 people in 1937. There was a time that Ohio only held senior fairs, with no judgings for children's exhibits and no junior fairs, until September of 1923, when Charles Ashbrook, had the idea to begin the junior exhibition at the Ashley Fair. 35 young men from the agricultural program at the school showed hogs in a small tent during that inaugural junior fair. Members of the fair board were initially lukewarm to the idea of a junior fair, but a teacher at the agricultural school lobbied the board for the opportunity for his students to put their lessons into practice. Eventually, the two required board members backed the idea and the Junior Fair was born. Initially, financial backing for the Junior Fair came from part of the profits for the livestock sale at the Ashley Fair. Three years in, though, the proceeds paid for the construction of the first Junior Fair building. Then, in 1929, Mr. Ashbrook was asked to start a similar program for the Ohio State Fair in Columbus. According to the website for the Ohio State Fair, one of the outstanding influences in the dynamic development of the present Ohio State Fair is a gigantic junior fair with its broad program for the youth of Ohio. The first agricultural exhibit for young people was held at the Ashley. Jumping ahead a few years now, World War II caused the cancellation of the Ashley Fair in 1943, and the fair resumed later, but to an uncertain future. The Delaware County Fair was larger, had a bigger budget, and better, larger facilities. Attendance in Ashley declined, and the debt increased. 1949 was the final year for the Ashley Fair, and on a March evening in 1950, the board voted to dissolve the fair and its grounds. All fair buildings, acreage, and equipment went up for auction to pay off the remaining $2,500 mortgage. On February 24, 1951, Ernest Thompson, a retired carpenter from Columbus, purchased the fair for $7,900 and prepared plans to develop the site of the fairgrounds. Now, there are apartments that sit on the 21-acre plot of land that once housed the Ashley Fair, and there's an old racetrack that's still visible. Our research was not able to determine if this is the original fair racetrack, so if any folks out there know any details we do not, please reach out to Robbie and us at the History Committee. 
Once the fair's final expenses were settled, the remaining money was placed into an endowment with interest. The fair board used this money for several years to purchase trophies for the outstanding boys and girls who now exhibited their projects at the Delaware County Fair. Perhaps those trophies were purchased right down the road at the RB Powers Company. The RB Powers Company started off in the Rollins Powers Cobbler Shop in 1907. The business grew and eventually was moved into an abandoned two-story schoolhouse in Ashley and began making prize ribbons for the Ashley Fair in 1923. Originally, the company was run by just one employee in the cobbler shop and eventually grew it to a staff of 50 and employed local college students home on breaks. RB Powers Company is still going strong, still making ribbons in a two-story schoolhouse in Ashley. Later on, the RB Powers Company would be supplying prize ribbons for sporting events, cat shows, beauty pageants and fairs in Ohio and around the world. It was one of just four ribbon printers nationwide and was one of the largest factories machining ribbons in the entire world. If you've ever received a prize ribbon, there's a pretty good likelihood that it was manufactured in Ashley at the RB Powers Company. By this point, I'm sure you're asking aloud, what goes into the manufacturing of these ribbons? How does RB Powers do it? Well, hang on to your hats. Brass and bronze and occasionally gold leaf were used for the wordage on the ribbons. Gold leaf though was expensive, so companies would send the unused trim scraps back to the gold leaf manufacturers. In 1959, one of these gold leaf ribbons could cost as much as $1.50. Small as it was, RB Powers was a manufacturing force using over 1 million yards of ribbon per year. Most often satin was used, although sometimes customers would ask for pure silk instead. The creation of one ribbon required 78 different hand and machine operations, with the lettering and hems always being done by hand. The RB Powers Company repurposed machines from shoe manufacturers and bookbinding companies to create the first machines expressly for the purpose of ribbon manufacturing. The company eventually added trophies, banners, and silk screening to its offerings. Step aside, Circleville. Next up, the Delaware Pumpkin Show. In the early 1900s, the Pumpkin Show of Pumpkin Shows was held on the streets of downtown Delaware, and it was apparently quite a hot ticket. Entry tags were prepared for a thousand competitors for the first Delaware Pumpkin Show, but the show drew over 2,500 entries. Ira Evans brought his potential prize winner from just outside the city in a wheelbarrow. And John Lore of Sunbury showed off a monster 154 pound beauty of a pumpkin. The pumpkin show originally ran along Sandusky Street, south of Winter. Vegetable booths and displays lined Sandusky, and hogs and sheeps were displayed between William and Spring Streets. 75 animal pens were arranged on East William Street, and draft horse entries were housed between Sandusky and Union. Pony races were held from Sandusky down to the river, and the vacant Delaware Underwear Company on South Sandusky had women's displays. It was recorded that this massive pumpkin show displayed in one particular year 198 horses, 22 hogs, 53 sheep, 99 grain entries, 54 fruit entries, 248 vegetable, 84 pies, breads, and cakes, 139 needlework displays with the women's exhibition, 186 canned foods and butter entries, 220 paintings, 246 poultry entries, and a handful each of cut flowers and potted plants. Truly something for everyone and not a tiny local gathering. Agricultural and livestock displays not your thing? Well, the Delaware Pumpkin Show grew to include attractions for all attendees. In October of 1919, the first community dance was held during the pumpkin show. In the future, the dance would signal the end of the festivities. It was held between Elizabeth Street and Washington, and the streets were even resurfaced ahead of the fair for the best possible dance floor. 
The community dance started at 8 p.m. and the Lally Burr and Company Electric Shop provided lighting for the musicians and the dancers. On Winter Street, opposite the West School Building, the Watson Brothers Double Jazz Orchestra performed. The Pumpkin Show even featured a sight familiar to Delawareans today, a horse parade that began at 1 p.m. the day of the dance and featured harness horses, ponies, and Persian draft horses. Following the horse parade and with an encore performance at 7, Mosher the Contortionist performed by the post office. In front of the courthouse, serial ring gymnast H.L. Martin performed death-defying stunts. Like I said, something for everyone. There were displays brought in from all over the world, including an heirloom hand-spun nightgown, which was over 100 years old, and a quilt stitched from more than 4,000 pieces, both displayed by the Murray family of Montrose Street. Harmon Flatch of Berkshire Township was visiting the fair and suffered a horrific accident involving an aeromobile, a car that used a giant propeller like an airplane. Flatch was standing near the free act stage at the corner of Central Avenue when the aeromobile propellers started without warning. He would eventually succumb to his injuries at the Jane M. Case Hospital. The final year for the Delaware Pumpkin Show was 1922. The end of summer months of August and September are certainly associated with students heading back to school, but many states and communities nationwide will celebrate the end of summer by holding a fair, including Delaware. We hope you've enjoyed this look back at the pumpkin show and the history of the three fairs of Delaware County. Research was done in collaboration with the Powell Historical Society, found at powellhistory.org, the Delaware Historical Society at DelawareOhioHistory.org, the Warnstaff Memorial Public Library, and the Ohio Memory Project, which can be accessed by selecting the Research tab on the Delaware Library homepage.